So we are in week two of a new series that started last week on why character still matters. How many understand that that I, I think all of us at different points in our lives, we have a crisis of character. And, and we see it in our world, we see it in the political scene, we see it in the church, we see it in the school system. You know, any system alive, there is this dilemma, this crisis of character. What kind of people are we going to be? Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? What kind of people are we going to be? What kind of decisions are we going to make? And every day we're confronted with that. And so in this series, what we want to do is we want to, you know, take a look at some of those things that have to do with our character and talk about why character still matters, why it still matters in our world. Now, there are a lot of people that say, you know, character really doesn't matter. Just as long as you get what you want, doesn't matter who you run over, doesn't matter what you have to do to get ahead, just get ahead and then deal with the consequences later. And how many know that's just not how, how it works in God's system, in God's kingdom. And so he came to introduce a different way of thinking and living. And so we want to live into that. So in Mark chapter 10, we're told, and I shared a little bit last week, in Mark chapter 10, we're told that a, a young man who was rich and had many possessions, that he came running to Jesus with that, uh, a question. And his question was simple but profound. And that question was, what must, I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the young man wanted to know if he had done enough to share in God's new age and that age that was to come. And as Jesus listed six of the Ten Commandments, I just get the sense, as I read the Gospels, that this young man, he must have been excited inside. Because as Jesus talked about honoring your parents, it's like, I did that. As Jesus talked about not bearing false witness, not lying, he did that. And so as Jesus listed off six of the ten, I had this sense in my, in my heart that he was feeling pretty good about himself at that point. Maybe you've been there and you've looked at the Ten Commandments and you thought, you know what, I've done pretty good in probably just about all of those. And maybe you walk away and you feel pretty good about yourself, like I'm doing pretty good. So I think something was alive in him up until that moment, up until that threshold when Jesus said, but wait. In verse 21 of chapter 10, he says, but wait, there's one thing that you lack. I don't think he was expecting to hear that. I thought he, you know, I think he was thinking, you know what, I've done pretty good, I'm doing pretty good. And then Jesus dropped the bomb on him and Jesus said, but there's one thing you lack, go sell your possessions and give everything you have to the poor, come and follow me. So it was in that place that Jesus surprised that young man with those words. Cryptically speaking, Jesus was trying to get through a very profound, important thing to that young man who grew up in Jewish tradition and Jewish culture. He knew the Ten Commandments, right? He, he knew how to live according to them. But Jesus was trying to get through to him and for him to know and to understand that there was something more interesting, something much more profound and deeper than just keeping the rules. And Jesus then went off to say, hey, are you willing to put God first? And that's the same thing that continually that you and I are confronted with. Are we willing to put God first? See, Jesus said, go sell what you have, sell your possessions, give them to the poor, and then come follow me. What are those things that we're willing to put before God? See, that's what Jesus was confronting. Jesus was confronting him with the reality that character matters, that character is really important, that what we do with the decisions we make and how we handle life, that all those things add up, and, and character is very important because character is a reflection of what's going on in the heart. What's going on in the heart? So generally speaking, there were two things at work here. The first thing was this. Generally speaking, you think about humanity, we have generally two choices, right? Either you follow the rules, that's path one, or outside of that, you, you just chase after what's in your heart. Often that's what we hear in our world today. In the religious world, you could grow up thinking, you know what, if I only obey the rules, try to live by the Ten Commandments, try to do things right in my life, then I'm okay. God will accept me because I'm willing to live by the rules. Path A or one path. And then on the other side of that, you hear all the time, no, just follow your heart. Who cares about the rules that you break as long as you follow what's in your heart? Be true to what's in you. 
So generally speaking, there are those two options presented in the world. And we see those two options presented with this rich young man. He had been following the rules, and yet Jesus said that wasn't good enough. And then at the end of the day, he wasn't willing to follow Jesus. So in that sense, he wanted to go after what was in his heart, because what did he want in his heart? He wanted his possessions. He didn't want to let go of his things. He didn't want to put God first in that area. So we have those two clearly presented here in this story. So Mark chapter 10 is a powerful visual of these two thoughts. He had lived by the rules, at least six of them, and when Jesus responded to his question with an answer, an answer that he did not like, it says that he put his head down and he walked away sad. Why? Because he wasn't willing to do hard things. He wasn't willing to do the hard things. He wasn't willing to put God first. So with the words, come and follow me, Jesus showed us a different way. He showed us that there's another way. And that way consists of following God, which is much harder than just obeying rules and much harder than just following your heart because it includes includes putting God first. It's much harder to, in life to put him first. And so that's why character matters because it's this, this process, this, this place of you and I being reminded that we're to put him first. First before our money, first before our decisions, first before anything that life has to offer. And we're confronted continually with that reality. Who's going to be first in our lives? Are we going to put God first or are we going to put someone else first? Are we going to put money first, my job first, my pleasure first? All of those things. So on this path, we learn, and it's a process. It's a lifetime process. And that's the process that God invites us into, this process of the shaping of our character, the transformation of our hearts. And it happens throughout the course of our lives. You don't just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus, and you put him first, and then everything is good from that point on. No, it's this process of becoming like Jesus more and more every day, every moment, with every decision throughout the course of our lifetime, whatever that dash of your life consists of, within that dash, You and I are learning, we're growing, we're being presented with this opportunity to put him first. It's a lifetime process. So on this path, we learn to put God first. Following Jesus, that's what we're confronted with. Will we put God first? So here's the thing, and I I showed that last Sunday, but our character is transformed as we do. And then as a result of that, what happens? (laughs) We do the right things. And we follow God's heart because his laws are written on our heart. And then in the process of that, what do we discover? A life of fulfillment, a life of happiness. Why? Because we're putting God first. That's where true happiness and contentment and fulfillment is found in putting God first. But that's the reality, though. It's not easy. If it was easy, anybody could do it. And many people aren't willing to do it, and that's where they walk away because they're not willing to put God first. It's easier to follow some rules, or it's easier just to merely follow what's in your heart. But as we follow him and we put him first, we find this reality that God transforms our heart. So it's not this outside-in thing where we're forced to live a certain way because of these outside forces, these outside rules. No, it's this inside-out, inside-out. Peace, contentment, fulfillment, inside out, inside out. I'm loving God. I'm following his commands. Why? Because it's in my heart too. Because he's changing and transforming my heart. Okay, let's pick up in Mark chapter 1. And uh, we're just going to read a couple verses here as we continue along this this thought of, of following of following Jesus. And the implications of that and, and the implications on our character as we do. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16. It's on the screen there. If you need a Bible, feel free to pull one out. Starting there in verse 16, Mark wrote, and he said this. And it's very familiar for, for some of us, maybe. But let's read it. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he, speaking of Jesus, Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea. For they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them as well. 
And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went after him. Notice, they left everything to go after Jesus. Now, this, this week I read a story about a, a choir director who began working with the church choir. And, and uh, the problem with the church choir is they hadn't had a director uh, previously for a number of years. And so I think it was easy to say that they were stuck in a rut. Easy to say that they didn't sound very good. Easy to say that for the most part it was a real struggle to get out, a, uh, if I could say it this way, a joyful sound. I mean, they, they loved to sing, but they really didn't have any leadership. They really didn't know what they were doing. And so they tried hard but the outcome wasn't always this beautiful, you know, harmonious, you know, musical melody of, hey, let's listen to some more of that amazing music. How many know what I'm talking about? And, and uh, so that's what the, this choir consisted of. And it didn't matter how hard they worked. It didn't matter how hard they, they, they worked. They just didn't get any better. And that was just the reality. And so when the new choir director began working with the choir, he didn't do anything like magical. He didn't show up and, and do anything that just, you know, you and I wouldn't do. But what he did, like you and I would do, is he began to meet them where they were. And he began to work with them in that place. And he began to find out what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were. He began to find out who, you know, played which part and how well they did it and, and all of those things. And pretty soon he was able to put certain people together and he was able to say, okay, this is one of our strengths, and so we can sing these kinds of hymns or these kinds of songs. And, and so he began working with them right where they were at, and in the process, he made these discoveries, and pretty soon, you know what? They started to improve. And people in the church even began to recognize that there was some kind of transformation going on. It didn't take long to notice the difference in the choir, and it even started to sound like a choir, and one of the members of the church even remarked on how the choir had been transformed over time. And here's the thing that they said. It was amazing because the choir director took the same people but was able to produce a different sound. Same people, different sound. So on that particular day in Galilee, God's strategy for changing the world, it started with ordinary men started with ordinary men, right? They were just fishermen. They were ordinary men. They, they didn't make it as theologians. They didn't make it as rabbis. And so they were doing what they needed to do, and that was working with their father's business. And so they're just ordinary men minding their own business when Jesus comes along and invites them to be a part of this world-changing movement. But notice who God starts with. He always starts with ordinary men. Started with ordinary men, 12 you know what? You think about it. You expect something from extraordinary people. You expect them to be extraordinary. So what does God do? He takes it and he flips it and he begins with ordinary people because people don't expect anything from ordinary people, average people. So he, he starts there and he begins this, this movement. Notice where it began. Jesus encounters them and he says, come and follow me. It began with a call. You guys are going to love this word. That's a, that's a word that I love, but, but here it is. It began with a call to community. It began with a call to community. Jesus said, come and follow me. Follow me is a call to community. It's a call to love God. It's a call to put him first. It's a call to love him by loving and serving others. It's a call to become people of transformed character. And so that's his call to you and I. Will you come and follow me, Jesus says. Will you be a part of my community? The words follow me literally mean to walk after. So Jesus is saying, will you walk after me? Jesus' invitation was to that of community, to live with him to be close enough to him to get a sense of who he is and how he responds to adversity and what he does with criticism and where he turns when life begins to get rough and you don't know where to turn. What do you do in those moments? 
That's what Jesus invited them to be a part of, a community, to share life with him, to come alongside and, and to be with him, to walk beside him, to be close enough to know his heart, to know what he likes, what he dislikes. So as Jesus journeyed that day, they were to journey. He asked them to journey with him. He was asking them to pay close enough attention, to walk close enough to know how he lived his life to what he taught. That was his invitation. To be close enough to know what he was like, what he believed. And then the invitation was to mimic that. Listen to one man's interpretation of what this meant. He said, I did not go to the rabbi to learn interpretations of the Torah from him, but to note his way of tying his shoelaces and taking off his shoes in his actions, in his speech, in his bearing, and his faithfulness to the Lord, man must make the Torah manifest. That was the idea here is that the rabbi would make God manifest and become as one who would follow close enough. That would be the idea that you would follow close enough so that God could be manifested in your life as well. That how he lived would rub off on you. That your heart would be transformed and changed to look like his heart. The ancient belief was the person you were following would cause the word of God, that he would cause the word of God to come alive for you, that you would see it in action, lived out. As the person walked close enough, it would change the heart and the attitudes and the actions to be like that of the one they were following. See, that's what they believed it meant to walk in the dust of a rabbi, of the rabbi, of the one they were following. In Hebrew, the word walk, it, spe it speaks of how you live. It speaks of your whole lifestyle, your whole life, what makes you who you are and how you live. It's how you carry yourself morally. It's what you do up here, and it's how that carries out and how you interact in your business transactions and how you interact with other people. See, take it on the lifestyle of the rabbi was the point of the call of those first followers of Jesus. That was, that was their intention, to become just like him. And there's no getting away from the way in which this was intended to take shape. And it was intended to take shape within the call of community. Call of community. Listen, when it comes to Christian character becoming like our rabbi, this is huge. It's huge. This is where our hearts are transformed in community. This is where our character is transformed, when you and I are in relationship with each other. See, it doesn't happen in a vacuum by itself. It happens as we're put in pressure situations. It happens when we're, you know, when there's stress, when there's pressure, when there's conflict, when there's unrealistic expectations, when you hurt and when you get hurt. When people are saying and doing stupid things, right? That's where we're invited to be a part of community where there's pressure. And as there's pressure, as we're following our rabbi together, guess what? That's where our character and our nature and our, our you know, the transformation of our heart takes place. As it's as we're in relationship as we follow our rabbi together. See, all of this Hurt feelings, bad theology, saying dumb things, right? Not allowing people to see our true selves, to see in, keeping it all super, you know, superficial because we have insecurities, because we have flaws. See, all of those things, all of those things can get in the way of, of true community. But all of these things are exposed if you want to have your trans, if you want to have your character transformed. And we all come with a tag, and that tag says, as is. Keith, as is. Andrew, as is. Billy, as is. Debbie, as is. Tyson, as is. You and I, we all have a tag, and it says, as is. And the whole point of community is learning that each of us have those tags and learning to love even though we have those tags. Think about it. Mark chapter 10, it begins with, they're, they're arguing over divorce and remarriage. 
right? We, we love to argue theology today. We love to argue matters of doctrine and who's right and who's wrong and who's closer to the truth and who's only got the truth and everybody else is wrong. And that's just a, you know, a reality of that. But that's a part of the work. We have James and John positioning themselves to be on the left and the right of Jesus. Right? That's their whole, uh, you, you have the, the disciples whispering about who's the greatest. Right, they're vying for position, jockeying for position so they can be recognized as somebody closer to Jesus, as somebody who has more authority, more power. Right, even in Jesus' as closest as 12, this is going on. We have Peter who is rash and, and quick to make wrong judgments and come to wrong conclusions. He cut off the, the ear of Malchus, right? When they came for Jesus, Peter drew his sword and before he had an opportunity to respond, to think, he cut his ear off. And Jesus said, ah, that's not really the way we want to do it. And Jesus picks up his ear and puts it back on. <laughs> Showed him a different way. In Mark chapter 8, it was Peter who began to rebuke Jesus. Remember, Jesus began to share with his disciples what was to come and shared about his life and suffering and death. And Peter's like, hey, wait a minute, you're Messiah. You're not going to die that way. Not on my watch. And it's there that Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. Talk about dysfunction. <laughs> you rebuked him for not having the purposes of God in mind. How often is that the case in the church where it's about what we want and what we have a right to and who's going to pay because somebody hurt us? And so it's easy for those things. We don't have the purposes of God in mind. It's easy for those things to creep in. We want what we want because it's what we want. Right, just like Peter. And then we have Judas. Judas, the, the big betrayer, right? He was crazy about money. Greed had, had corrupted his heart. Sin has a way of corrupting our hearts. And it says that, that that greed, that sin, that it cost him to ultimately deny and reject Christ. By the way, one of the 12. So again, we have the disciples arguing over who was the greatest, and, and then we have the disciples with blind Bartimaeus and with the children. They're like, hey, Jesus doesn't have time for you, trying to shut them down, silence Bartimaeus and silence the kids. Jesus has more important things, and Jesus said, no, this is important. Let me bless the kids, bring the kids. And then he goes on to say, unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. See, all of this was going on in the midst of community. And again, think about it. Wherever two or three or people together are gathered together, you have potential for dysfunction. But you also have the other side. You have this opportunity for something beautiful and amazing to come forth. Church, following Jesus isn't easy. Hurting people hurt people. I don't care if it's in the church, outside the church, you're 80 years old, you're, you're, you know, you're 15 years old. Hurting people hurt people. Even good intended people, people with good intentions still can hurt other people. You can have an amazing relationship with your wife or your spouse and still hurt your spouse. And you can have the best intentions and still find that you hurt your spouse or somebody close to you. See, it doesn't matter about your intentions. Those things just happen. We say and we do things that we want to take back. Jealousy comes in and, you know, we don't like that somebody's closer to somebody and, and, and it's just a reality. And so, you know, jealousy, we have positioning for power and influence. It's just as alive today as it was then with those original 12. And yet, what did Jesus do? He worked with the 12. He invited them into his closest, most intimate space. And the same is true with Christ. He invites us into our most, his most closest and intimate space. And that space is the church and its relationship with him. What about unmet expectations? They happen. What about unrealistic expectations that we put on ourselves and we put on others? What about insecurities? Anybody have any of those? Anybody ever been let down by somebody? And they had no idea that they let you down. And so you're let down and you're, you know, you're creating this gap and they have no clue. They're just like, what is going on here? They let you down. 
See, what I just described is what real life looks like. And if you're looking for a perfect church and perfect people, you're not going to find it. Jesus didn't start with a perfect church and perfect people. He started with 12 ordinary men who had lots of dysfunction, lots of brokenness. In case you haven't looked around, we live in a very broken world. And just because you decide to follow Jesus doesn't mean that he completely fixes all of our... See, that's what he invites us into is this character-shaping transformation. And it's a lifetime again. We don't get it right all the time. So it's within this picture of imperfection that we're invited to follow Christ. They were called to community because character isn't formed in a vacuum. It's formed in real life when we're surrounded by real people with real needs and real wants and real expectations and real disappointments and real brokenness. We're shaped through real life experiences, both the good and the bad. I'm probably going to say something at some point, if I haven't already, that you don't like. You have to figure out what you're going to do with that. How are you going to respond to that? And if I say multiple times things you don't like, you got to figure out what to do with that. But that's part of living in community. So when you're in community, you learn to work through differences, you learn to talk through things, and you learn to do hard things. You learn to do hard things. That means when you're let down or you're disappointed or somebody says something you don't like, either you let it go or you learn to talk about it. You don't let it get in your heart and you don't let it build up bitterness and you don't let it build up walls. And if you do, you can't let it happen very long because you know very long if that continues to happen, what happens is bitterness moves in, resentment moves in, then pretty soon you're mad at the church. Well, who's the church? You're the church. You're mad at the world. And then, you know, everybody's a hypocrite. And everybody's out for me. You find yourself being a victim, right? That's just, not to say you're going to go that far, but that's just where it leads if you continue to go down that road. So in community, we learn about forgiveness. In community, in relationship, you learn about forgiveness. You learn about the importance of it. And that's where we get to practice it. It's when you live in community. See, it's much easier See, some of us, we don't live in community. Why? Because we're not willing to do the hard things of living in community. Because it's easier to get upset. It's easier to, you know, carry on, uh, carry on forgiveness in our hearts than doing the hard work of, of working through things. So it's within this picture, this in, picture of imperfection, of the disciples, they learned how to follow God. But notice where it started. It started on a seashore with 12 ordinary men. And it's within this picture of imperfection the disciples learned how to follow him. It's where they learned, again, about forgiveness. This is where the reality of God comes alive in us. Remember one of the disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, how many times must I forgive the person that, you know, offends me? Seven times? That seems like a good number. And Jesus says, no, how about 70 times 70? What is he saying? The most important thing is that you follow me. And as you want to be a follower of Jesus, what do you have to do? You have to learn how to forgive. Living in communion with others is one of the tools that God gives. Listen, it's a tool and it's a blessing if we'll see it that way. It's one of the tools that God gives us to shape our character and the nature of who we are to transform our hearts. And so I want to ask here today, how are you doing at living in community with others? How are you doing? Right? We, we live in this, this age of, of media and Facebook and Snapchat, and we live in this age now where we don't have to see people face to face. And so it just creates this, isol, you know, this isolationalist perspective where we can isolate ourselves even further from people and relationships. If we don't like somebody, if somebody says something we don't agree with, it's easier just to separate and it's easier to hide behind a screen and behind a tag name. Jesus calls us in community. And if everybody could do it, everybody would. But again, what I just painted was one side of it. But listen, there's another side. 
There's another side. There's also the side of Peter walking on water. Can you imagine being in the boat that day and walk, watching Peter walk on water? See, imagine the faith that it just stirred in, in those, those other disciples as they walked. Peter, do something they weren't willing to do. And when somebody like, when you're living in a community with somebody and you see somebody step out and do something you would never do, what does that do? It stirs faith. And you look at it and you say, if they can do it, you know what? I can do it. There's that side. What about Peter in Acts? When he stands up and remember the guy that, that ran from uh, any kind of responsibility, any kind of association with Christ, denying him, and now on the day of Pentecost, he stands up and, and he says, this is that, and he points to and said, you know, this is what, this is God, this is how he's at work. This is how you've missed the Messiah, the, the courage to do that. What about Peter growing to a point of willingly embracing the reality that God had accepted Gentiles? And you find that in Acts as well with Cornelius and that whole vision and everything that happened there. Or what about, what about the disciples coming back after an awesome ministry trip where people were healed and where demons were cast out and it says they were excited, they were rejoicing over the reality that God had met them. There was demonstration of the kingdom. Must have been an exciting day. Do you live for that day? Do you dream of that day? Are you being used and believing God for God to use you at your workplace where you go to be used in the same way? Or what about Peter and John at the gate beautiful that day when they, they said, silver and, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. <laughs> Amazing. What about John writing the gospel? What about James being a leader in the early church? What about Philip going and being an evangelist and his daughters, had two daughters that were prophets and they were prophesying and, and a whole family going out and being used by God. Listen, there will always be threats to community life. There's no getting around it. There's no perfect church. There's no perfect people. The good news of this text is found in what happened in the midst of imperfection as we follow Jesus. See, we have the, we have the awesome perspective of knowing what happened in the end. Yes, Judas denied Christ, but 11 of them followed Jesus and their hearts were transformed and they became part of the greatest movement. And one day, you know what? One day we'll see them. And everything that we've been able to read about, they'll be there. And, and they'll be able to share their stories and their experiences. And what an amazing day that will be. But listen, they did the hard work. Eleven of them did the hard work. God uses people in our experiences, all of them, to transform and shape, shape our character. See, transform people. Listen, this is why character matter, why character matters. Transform people manifest God to the world. Transform people manifest God's presence, his power, his reality to the world. And that's what Jesus invited those 12 to do. He said, come and follow me and I will make you something. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. What is a fisher of men? It speaks of manifesting God's glory, his presence to the world. God, that same invitation is issued to you and I to, to transform people who manifest God to the world. That's why character still matters. So if I can have the, the worship team come up and, and join me. I want to I want to ask here in closing, if you want to pull out your communication card, there are a couple next steps there if you take time to look at those and, and invite you to, to take those with you and to think about this. And if there's something that's been on your heart in particular, uh, please pay attention to that. But I want to ask, the question I want to ask you here today is what is keeping you from following closer? What is keeping you from following closer? Is it sin? Is it hurt? Come on. You and I, we, we've been around long enough to know what happens when you get hurt. Is you begin to distance yourself from that person. And so if you get hurt by somebody in the church, if you get hurt by another person, that has a way of affecting this vertical relationship. And what does that do? It creates this distance. It creates this space. 
And it takes somebody like me or somebody like a spouse or somebody that knows you well enough to be able to confront you and say, you know what, I notice that you're not walking as close as as you used to, to Christ. You're no longer allowing his dust to cover you. What's going on? Oh, I think I know what it is. I think it's something that somebody said. I think it's an experience that you had. I think it's something that that happened and and you're holding on to that thing and you're carrying that thing and and it's... you're no longer being covered by the dust of the rabbi. You're not close, to, you're not in that place anymore. So maybe for you, it's to let go of that hurt. Maybe you're here today and you have a critical spirit. <laughs> you're critical of everything and everybody. And sometimes you forget that you have your own tag. I like to come back to that reality and ask myself that. I mean, if I'm critical of others, do I want others being critical of me? can't have it both ways, right? If you're going to be critical of others, you better be ready to have people be critical of you. What about you, you created your own mess? Is this war within you? Is there this war within you to do what you want to do? See, you want to follow what's in your heart. And Jesus comes and he says, no, I want you to do the hard thing. You say, no, I want to follow what's in my heart. I want to do it my way. I don't want to follow you. I want to hold on to what I have. Lord, I just ask in this moment, here this morning, God, that you would open our minds and open our hearts. Lord, that you would speak to us. Father, I thank you, Lord, that that people are important. Lord, it's what you use, God, to further the kingdom. So we thank you, Father, that you chose 12 ordinary men. You choose us. Lord, and the call to follow you is a call to be a part of the church. It's a call to be a part of community. So Lord, help us to see it that way and to look for the good and the beauty and the majesty of learning to work together to be part of something amazing.